We come now to the book of Obadiah. Obadiah was a prophet who penned this, this, uh, this letter, this book, and it is the shortest book in the entire Old Testament. It's only one chapter. It's only 21 verses total. And, uh, and I'm going to give you a little background, as I have been doing with the other books of the Minor Prophets. So here's a little background on Obadiah. Nothing's known about him. We, we don't know where he was born. We don't know um, when he lived, uh, who were his parents. The Bible is silent about it. Uh, we do know from his name, there's no B in the Hebrew alphabet. It's, it's a V. And so in Hebrew, his name is pronounced Ovadia. Ovadia in Hebrew translates servant of Yahweh or worshiper of Yahweh. So we know something about him because of his name. He's a servant of Yahweh. He's a worshiper of Yahweh, Yahweh being the name of God. There are at least a dozen Obadiahs mentioned in the Bible. This Obadiah is believed not to be any of those. And so, um, again, we have no particular insight into him. There's a, probably the most uh, famous of the Obadiahs is the servant of King Ahab mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 18, but that is not the same Obadiah. This guy who, who's, uh, who, who is the one who penned this, this book is not mentioned anywhere else. And it's hard, therefore, to date his prophecy, except that when you look at some of the verses we're actually going to look at today, it appears that he is referencing the Babylonian invasion of Jerusalem. If that's the case, then we date his prophecy somewhere written around 586 to 553 BC, because the invasion of the Babylonians uh, and ransacking the city of Jerusalem happens in 586 BC, and he references this. So it has to be that date or later. And this prophecy is unique. This particular book, uh, Obadiah, is different from all the other minor prophets in that his letter is not addressed to the Jewish people. It is directed towards the Edomites. The Edomites are the distant cousins of the Israelites. And we're going to talk about them and kind of the history and background. We're going to look at who are the Edomites. And we're also going to see here that this story in Obadiah actually has a connection to the Christmas story, believe it or not. And so I'm going to weave in a little bit of Christmas at the tail end of this. But we'll talk all about that and more in today's study <laughs> of Obadiah. <laughs> I'm going to read here first 15 verses. Look at your Bibles with me. Verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. See, there you have it, Edom and the descendants, Edomites. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be searched out. Note that name Esau. How his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Taman, shall be dis dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother, in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who 
who remained in the day of distress. For the Lord, the day of the Lord, upon all the nations is near. And as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. Let's pause there and pray. Father, we thank you for this time together as we look into this ancient text that you would bring to light its modern application that together we will be stretched, challenged, Lord, changed as we just now come to the word and open it up and ask you to use your word to minister to our hearts today. I thank you for all those who are here. Thank you those who are watching online and especially as we approach a very busy time of the year. We just are grateful that we can come into your house, just kind of settle our hearts before you, and just wait upon you, Lord. So speak to us, we pray, and minister to our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Well, there's a story about a big city slicker lawyer from New York who decided to go down to Texas for a, a duck hunting trip. And um, he, uh, he shot a duck, and, and the duck fell down into a field that belonged to a farmer, and there was a fence around it. So just as the lawyer from New York was about ready to climb over the fence, the farmer pulled up in his pickup truck with a shotgun. He says, what do you think you're doing, son? He says, well, I just shot, I shot a duck, and it landed in your field, and I've come to retrieve it. He said, you ain't going to retrieve it in my field, because once that duck lands in my field, it's now my duck. That lawyer said, I'm a good lawyer. I'm going to sue you for everything you got if you don't let me climb over this fence and get that duck. He said, son, you don't know how it's done here in Texas. In Texas, we have the three-kick rule. He said, what's the three-kick rule? He goes, well, this is how it works, son. He says, I get to kick you first three times, then you kick me three times. Then I kick you three times, and then you kick me again three times, and the last man standing gets the duck. That's how we do it here in Texas. Well, the lawyer sized him up. He was younger than the farmer. He's like, I could take this guy easily. So he said, all right, old man, you go for it. So the farmer climbed out of his truck, gave him a swift kick in the groin, bent him over, then kicked his face, almost knocked his nose off. The guy's on the ground and then kicks him in the kidney really hard. That lawyer's just laying there flat on the ground. He decides, I can't let this old coot win. So he musters up every strength he has. He stands up. He says, all right, farmer, it's my turn. The farmer says, that's okay, you can keep the duck. (laughs) Now that's what's happening here in the book of Obadiah. You say, where do you see that, Pastor G? Well, here's what's happening. Historically and consistently, the Edomites have been kicking the Israelites when they're down. And God takes note of it. He says, I I see the way you've been mistreating the Israelites. You've been taking advantage of them. You've been kicking them when they're down. And so God calls them to account, and he sends the prophet Obadiah to speak to the Edomites. Now, who exactly are the Edomites? We have to get a little historical context to understand our story and what is happening here. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau, who was the the twin brother of Jacob. The Bible says that which, by the way, is, is why the name Esau is mentioned here in the book of Obadiah several times, because the Edomites are descendants of Esau. So in the book of Genesis, it tells us that Abraham had a son, and his name was Isaac, and that Isaac married a woman named Rebekah. And together, Isaac and Rebekah had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Now, Esau was the older of the, t- of the two, because Esau was born first. And in Genesis 25, 25, it gives kind of a... A, I don't know, an unusual, peculiar description of Esau upon his birth. In Genesis 25, 25, it says, Esau came out red, and I'm reading from it, and he was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. So he comes out red and hairy. And the Bible records it specifically, red and hairy. That's what baby Esau looked like. I don't know if you know this, but archaeologists uncovered a picture of him a long time ago. Right here, I have it for you, right there. There it is, right there. Red and hairy. I'm so, uh, that's a cute, that's a cute little orangutan right there. So that's probably, I'll have to apologize to Esau probably one day, but that, I'm just saying with the Bible, what the Bible says red and hairy, that's what I think of 
and, uh, and kind of an unusual uh, baby born like that. And they name him Esau because Esau in Hebrew means hairy. Not H-A-R-R-Y, H-A-I-R-Y. They're like, well, the, the kid came out hairy, let's just call him Harry. So the rest of his life, they call him Harry, Esau. Now, it's kind of cruel, I know, but that's just kind of how they did it back in the day. Esau was a man of the field, the Bible says. He grows up, he's kind of a, a man's man. You know, he's a hunter. He likes flannel shirts and burly beards. He likes guns and pickup trucks, and he listens to Blake Shelton. That's Esau, okay? Now, his twin brother Jacob was very, very different. Uh, Jacob, the Bible says, was a man of the tents. He was, he was a homebody. He was kind of a mama's boy. He was very smooth and clean-shaven. He, he, uh, he, he dressed very prim and proper, liked to tie sweaters around his neck, and he listened to Bruno Mars. I mean, that's just... He was just very, very different than Esau. They were, they were two good guys, but they were very, very different people. Now, the Bible tells us on one occasion, and many of you are familiar with this, that Esau was out one day doing what Esau does. He's out hunting. He, likes, he has a taste for wild game, and he's out hunting. Jacob is back home. He's watching the Food Network channel, and he's making stew. And Esau, after a hunting expedition, is so famished that when he comes home and he sees Jacob's got the stew ready, Esau wants a bowl of the stew. But Jacob, being true to his name, because in Hebrew his name is Yaakov, and Yaakov in Hebrew means deceiver or manipulator, says to Esau, I'll sell you a bowl of stew. Esau's like, well, who do you think you are selling me a bowl of stew? He goes, yeah, I'm the one who's been home all day making this, and so I will sell it to you. Here's the cost your birthright. Now, let me tell you something about the birthright in ancient Jewish times. Esau was the oldest born son in the family. The birthright entitled him to three things. Number one, twice the inheritance from the father when dad died. That was just a privileged status. You're the firstborn son. You get a birthright. It's actually a legal doc document entitling you to twice the inheritance of the dad when dad dies. Number two, you would get the paternal blessing. Dad, before he dies, would pray over you as the oldest son and would bestow upon you the paternal blessing. And number three, you would become the patriarch of the family when dad died. It was a very privileged status in that day. To be the firstborn son was a special status indeed. Jacob, over a bowl of stew, convinced Esau to sell it to him. Esau gave Jacob his birthright for a bowl of soup. I want you to think on that for just a moment. I almost said stew on that for a moment, but that's a bad pun. <laughs> In a moment of fleshly desire, he compromised a very sacred thing. There are many times in our lives where we will be confronted with what is valuable. Please do not trade it for something that is sinful. Now, there's nothing wrong with human appetite. God's given us a human appetite. But in the moment, his hunger mastered him. His appetite mastered him. Not what was right, but what was expedient. And we get ourselves in deep trouble when we do what is expedient rather than what is right. And Esau, in a moment of weakness, in a, in, a, in a moment of expediency, decided, I want to satisfy my physical hunger. The birthright means nothing. And he sold it to Jacob. And so they became uh, at odds. Now, when Esau, the Bible says in Genesis 20, ver 25, verse 30, when Esau took the bowl of stew in exchange for the birthright, it tells us specifically that it was a red stew. I don't know, maybe a tomato base or whatever. It was a red stew. And therefore, when he ate the stew, and because the Bible says also he was born red and hairy, he was nicknamed at that moment Edom, because Edom in Hebrew means red. So between what the Bible describes as his, just kind of, you know, the color of his skin, just kind of ruddy, reddish, that's what it's meant by red, he's just ruddy, he comes out ruddy, and he's eating a red bowl of stew, he gets nicknamed in Genesis 25, verse 30, Edom meaning red. Thus, all of Esau's descendants are the Edomites. Now, most of you are familiar with the fact that Jacob is renamed by God to Israel. 
Israel means governed by God. It's a wonderful story where a guy who's named Jacob, deceiver, manipulator, has an encounter with God, and once he has that encounter with God, God says, now your new name is governed by God. No longer will you be deceiver, manipulator, you will now be governed by God. He takes on the country's namesake. He becomes Israel. The country is gonna be named after him, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, okay? Jacob's descendants are thus the Israelites. Esau, his brother's descendants, are the Edomites. And the sibling rivalry continues for generation upon generation. And this whole thing about the stew was not really the worst or the most offensive thing between these two brothers. The worst thing that happened was later on, when, as many of you know, their dad Isaac was nearing death. And he was old in years, and so he was also practically blind at this time. And part of that paternal blessing that went along with the birthright was that Jacob wanted dad to lay hands on him and bless him as the patriarch. But Jacob knew that he had deceived Esau for the birthright. In fact, the Bible doesn't even tell us that Isaac knew that Jacob had deceived Esau for the birthright. It was a negotiated thing between two brothers. So with that in mind, Jacob and mama, Rebecca, because he's a mama's boy, the two of them decided we got to deceive dad in his old age to give you the blessing that was intended for Esau. And mom comes up with this idea, because Jacob, you're fair skinned and smooth, even though dad's blind, he can still smell and touch. And when you get near him for the blessing, he's gonna feel you and you're all smooth skinned and you don't feel furry like your brother Esau. So we gotta dress you up. And so they take a goat and they take the hide of a goat, just the fur of a goat, and they put it on Jacob's, the Bible tells us this, on Jacob's arms, on the back of his neck. Okay, to make him look like Esau. What did Esau look like? But anyway, <laughs> goat boy, you know, and so there Jacob is, and they splash some dirt on Jacob too. We got to get you smelling earthy because Esau's a really earthy guy, but you're, you know, you, you smell like cookies, Jacob. So we got we to gotta splash some dirt on you and get you smelling really earthy. And so put on a flannel shirt like Esau and, and we'll put some goat skin all over you and you'll go into dad, which is what he does. And he goes into dad and Isaac in his old age, he, Jacob says, I'm here, dad. I'm not here, dad. <clears throat> And Isaac actually says it as, he, as Jacob draws near to him. Isaac says, well, it sounds like the voice of Jacob because he can't mask that. But when Isaac begins to feel his arms and the back of his neck and smell him, he's deceived and he's convinced that it is Esau. Jacob is living up to his name, the deceiver. And Isaac prays the blessing, the paternal blessing over Jacob, thinking that it was Esau. Esau will come in later and find out what has happened, and he will be so enraged that he will spend a lifetime trying to hunt Jacob down to kill him. This deep-seated bitterness and animosity between these two brothers has now been something that is transferred to their descendants. The Edomites and the Israelites become long-standing perennial enemies, all because of sibling rivalry. That's how it started. Now, Esau and Jacob will make amends. But by that point, you know how it is? Two people who are at odds can make amends and come back together. But because they've poisoned everybody else around them, and everybody else around them, friends and family, have taken sides. You know how that works? They've taken sides against the other person, and there's this internal conflict. The two people who are at odds might make amends, but you got all the peripheral people now who are still at odds with each other. That's what happens. And so Esau and Jacob eventually make amends, but their descendants never do. And for generation after generation after generation, the Edomites particularly are vindictive towards the Israelites. They have animus towards the Israelites. And they are always doing things to take advantage of them. In essence, at the start of the study, thus the three kick rule, they continued to kick the Israelites when they were down. And God says, enough. And he sends Obadiah to confront them. And Obadiah confronts the Edomites, and God indicts them in three ways. If you look in your Bibles here, in verses 10 to 13, there are three things that God says against the Edomites. Here are his indictments against the Edomites. In verse 10, for violence against your brother Jacob. Right? Now, now, they're distant cousins, right? Because the descendants of Esau, the descendants of Jacob... That makes them distant cousins, but they're still affectionately referred to here as your brother. He says, you, you Edomites, you descendants of Esau, 
You, you are now hold, uh, held accountable for your violence against your brother Jacob, against the Israelites. Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. Note that. We'll come back to it at the end. He says in verse 11, in the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. Now, here's what God is basically saying. He's describing here in this verse, verse 11, when the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem, took captive thousands of Jews and deported them as POWs back to Babylon. And what God saw was that during the invasion of the Babylonians against the Israelites, the Edomites were standing on the sidelines with their arms crossed, not helping their brother. Just like, oh, well, hard times come, hard times go. You know, you guys are getting your comeuppance kind of a thing. And they're standing on the sidelines. And God says, you were as one of them. You were just as bad as the Babylonians when they attacked the Israelites because you did nothing to come to the aid of of your brothers. So indictment number one against the Edomites was this, that they refused to help a brother in need. Listen, this is important for us to understand even in our day. Sometimes doing nothing is a great sin. Where you see a need or a problem and it is within your capacity to do something, to help, but you don't, God holds us accountable. It's sin. When we have it within our resources and our capacity and our ability to help someone that we see is in need or to come to their aid to help rescue them in a time of trouble and we remain silent and we do nothing, God sees it and he holds us accountable. You know, there's a familiar verse in the Bible. Most people don't really know where it is. Uh, to be honest with you, in the study of, the, of this sermon, I had to look up where is that verse. But there's a common verse that people quote a lot. It's a very sobering verse. And it says this, be sure your sins will find you out. Okay, it's one of those verses that people quote when they're like, you know, if there's anything sneaky going on in your life, be sure your sins will find you out. Because whatever you're doing that might be evil, God sees it and God's going to expose it. Okay. But that's kind of taken out of context. Here's the context. That verse is found in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. And here's the background of that verse. When the Israelites were given the allotment of land in the promised land, there were 12 tribes of Israel. 10 of the tribes settled on the western side of the Jordan River in what is today known as Israel. But there were two out of the 12 tribes that said to Moses, we like the land on the eastern side of the Jordan River in what is today Jordan. And we would like to live there. Can, can our two tribes live on the eastern side of the Jordan River? And Moses says to them in advance, he says, when you go over there and when you take that inheritance and you end up on the eastern side of the Jordan River, separated from your brothers because of a natural barrier, which is the Jordan River, Here's what you must do. If you're going to live over there, here's what you must do. You must still be willing to take up arms and come to the aid of your brothers when they get in war and conflict in, in regards to the settling of the land. So you have to come to their aid, okay? And, he, and, and, he's, and he's, you know, exhorting them. He's like, you can live over there on that side of the Jordan River, but you can't forget your brothers on the western side. You must take up arms, be ready to come over and fight for them because if you do nothing to come to their aid, be sure your sins will find you out. That's the context of that verse. It's the whole idea of the sin is doing nothing. So even though today we use that verse in, we misappropriate it, although I think principally it's true, but we misappropriate its context because we make it sound like if you're doing something sinful, be sure God will, will, you know, will expose it and, and your sins will be found out. Okay, that might be principally true, but that's not true of the text. The truth of the text is to do nothing is the sin that God sees. When it is within your capacity to help and to come to somebody's aid and you sit there and you do nothing, this is what he calls the Edomites out for. You refused to come to the aid of your brothers, the Israelites. And James 4.17 says, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, it is sin. Here's the second indictment. If you look in your Bibles at verse 12. In verse 12, Obadiah says, the Lord speaking through him, but you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced, circle that word, 
rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Here's indictment number two. They rejoiced over the Israelites' misfortune. Yeah, God calls them out there in verse 12. He says, you actually were glad that your fellow Israelites, your cousins here, were, were being besieged by the Babylonians. You took delight in that. And listen to me on this, because this is important for all of us to hear. God despises cheering from the sidelines when someone we don't get along with falls on hard times. Is the Bible not accurate for our lives even today? Because some of you are like, ouch. Because it's true. All of us at some point are probably guilty of that. If somebody has ever done you wrong, and if you don't think anybody's done you wrong, you're not old enough. When you get to be old enough, you realize, you know, that's what people tend to do, intentionally or unintentionally. When, when somebody has done you wrong, and then that somebody comes upon difficulty, is there a little tiny bit within you that is glad? Yeah, I mean, in our flesh. I'm not saying we should be. I'm just saying in our flesh, we kind of rejoice over that. We're like, yeah, hey, I, I didn't like that person. And now, you know, something's happening to them. And so, you know, suits them right. You know, you know, that kind of stuff suits them right. You know, they're just getting what they deserve. You know, karma, bro. Well, that's not even biblical, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Don't say bro and, and karma in the same sentence. All right. But there's a little bit of all of us that rejoice over the misfortune of others who have done us wrong. The Edomites feel like the Israelites have done us wrong. The Israelites feel like the Edomites have done us wrong back and forth. But the Edomites are standing on the sideline rejoicing that the Babylonians have come into Jerusalem and besieged the people and taken Israelites captive. Proverbs 24, verses 17 to 18 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. This is Proverbs 24, 17, and 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it, and he does, and it displease him, and it does, and he turn away his wrath from him. It's, it's kind of an ironic thing. It's like, you know, I shouldn't really rejoice that misfortune falls on somebody that has wronged me. On the other hand, if I'm sure not to rejoice, then God will get him. Because if I do rejoice, then God's going to withdraw his hand. So I shouldn't rejoice because I want God to get him. But I can't really think that thought because then <laughs> I would be rejoicing over that. So it's kind of a, it's a mind game. But at the end of the day, what we have to be aware of is, is there any internal, even the minutest celebration over the misfortune of someone who has wronged you? God says, I take note. I see this. It's interesting in the Bible, Job, in all of that he went through, okay, he decided to pray and make sure that there wasn't some kind of sin issue going on in his own life that was causing the misfortune. And one of the things that he highlights is this topic. He searches his heart to see if there's any rejoicing over his enemies. In Job chapter 31, verses 29 to 30, he says this, If I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, or lifted myself up when evil found him. So he's, he's taking personal inventory. He goes, you know, God, have I done this? And then the next verse he says, Indeed, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. So he realizes, okay, I haven't done that. But, but it's interesting in Scripture that he at least mentions that as this sinful tendency in all of us and Job even asks God, you know, could it be that in my own heart I've incurred some of these things in my life because I've been rejoicing over the misfortune of my enemies? I haven't prayed a curse down on them, God, so no, in reality, I have not wished harm to my enemies. That can't be the reason why I'm suffering as I am. But he at least wants to check his own heart. God sees this kind of thing. He doesn't want us to be glad or to rejoice over the misfortune of others that have wronged us in some way. And then the third thing, the last thing in verse 13 in verse 13, he says, You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So here's what he's saying. When the Babylonians rushed in, besieged Jerusalem, took thousands of Jews as POWs, transported them back to Babylon, the city was left basically in ruins, and the Edomites went in after the Babylonians and looted the place. And God saw it. 
And so the third indictment against them is that they resorted to selfish behavior and took advantage of the Israelites when they were down. They ransacked Jerusalem. The Edomites went in behind the Babylonians and looted the city. They helped themselves to the possessions of their cousins. That's what's meant here when God says, you laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So Israelites fall in hard time. The Babylonians come against them and deport them, and the Edomites rush in and help themselves to all the personal possessions of the Israelites for their own personal gain, their own selfishness. They capitalized on the Israelites' misfortune to profit themselves, and God took note. And therefore, God is judging the Edomites here, and He says to them, I'm going to totally erase you. I'm going to totally destroy you. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, there's a Christmas connection to all of this, okay? In the New Testament, Edomites are mentioned. There's a famous Edomite family, and it has everything to do with the Christmas story. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 2. If you want to turn there, you can if you just want to listen. It's, it's only a few pages over because you're already at the end of the Old Testament, so you can find Matthew pretty easily. And it's Matthew chapter 2. This is a very familiar part of the Christmas story. I'll read the first eight verses of Matthew chapter 2. This is what it says. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Of course, we know that that isn't true. He doesn't have any intention of worshiping baby Jesus. King Herod is threatened by the idea that there's another king in town. And when the wise men show up and they say, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Herod's thinking, I'm king of the Jews. Who are you talking about? They're like, well, there's a little baby that's been born, the star in the east, and it's guided us here. And so Herod calls in the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Is this true? They're like, yeah. They actually quote one of the minor prophets, the book of Micah. They say, yeah, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Oh, Okay, Bethlehem. Oh, king of the Jews. And Herod looks, oh, very inviting and welcoming. And he says, why don't you go make careful search for the child? And when you have found him, come back and tell me that I may worship him also. He has no intention of worshiping Jesus. He wants to weed him out. But after the wise men leave, an angel of the Lord warns them not to return the same way to Herod. And by the way, at the same time, an angel of the Lord has warned Joseph to take Mary and Jesus and, and, Jesus and escape to Egypt for a time until Herod dies. When Herod realizes he's been outwitted by the wise men, in Matthew 2, verses 16 to 18, he issues an edict demanding that all baby boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, it wasn't just restricted to Bethlehem, it was Bethlehem and its vicinity, the Bible says, to kill all the baby Jewish boys age two and younger in an attempt to try to kill the baby Jesus, who has already been taken to Egypt and escaped. This is Herod. Herod is a king who has been appointed by the Roman government to be king over the Jewish province of Judea. This is Herod. He's not only a king, he's a very insecure and brutal man. History tells us that he had a couple of his sons killed and one of his wives murdered because he thought they were trying to take over the throne, so he killed his own family members. This is Herod. The king, this is Herod, the insecure man, the brutal man. This is Herod, the murderer. Herod is the one who issues this decree for all the baby boys to be slaughtered in Bethlehem and its vicinity. I want you to try to imagine that day, that night. Dozens of families, I don't know, maybe hundreds, Bethlehem and its vicinity. How many two-year-old baby boys and younger were there in the day? There's not a specific record, but I want you to try to imagine the grief 
the wailing, the screaming, the cries. It's devastating. It's horrific. All because one man issues this decree, slaughter them. Herod the king, Herod the insecure man, Herod the brutal man, Herod the murderer, Herod the Edomite. Herod was an Edomite. History tells us that he was from Idumea. Idumea is the Greek term for Edom. Herod was a descendant of Esau. And the animosity of the brothers extends even into the Christmas story where an Edomite is murdering Israelites. And God sees. God sees all of it. And so the prophecy of Obadiah is fulfilled in 70 AD. If you'll look at one last verse with me and we'll close in verse 18, back in the book of Obadiah. In verse 18 of Obadiah, it says, the house of Jacob, that's the Israelites, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. Those are two terms for the Israelites. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them speaking of a fire, and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Show of hands, how many Edomites do you know? There aren't any. The Edomites were destroyed. You know when they were destroyed? The Lord specifically says here through the prophet Obadiah in verse 18, a fire will be kindled in Israel. But the ones who will suffer and die and be burned as stubble will be the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. In 70 AD, the Romans besieged Jerusalem one last time. I say one last time because the temple was destroyed and it has not yet to this day been rebuilt. The irony of all ironies is in 70 AD when the Romans came against the Jews to subdue a Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire, the Edomites came to the aid of their Jewish brothers. But it was too little too late. 20,000 Edomites, the last of the Edomites, were encircled by the Romans in 70 AD. This is not in the Bible, this is in history. Were encircled by the Romans in 70 AD in Jerusalem, and they were all burned in the fire that the Romans laid to the city of Jerusalem. And the last of the Edomites perished in 70 AD by fire just as Obadiah had prophesied hundreds of years earlier. Listen, God sees. His justice is true. And God is faithful to his promises, even the hard stuff. The Edomites were continual enemies of the Israelites, even down and including the time of the birth of Jesus, and even beyond, you know, the Herod dynasty. They were brutal people. Okay, John the Baptist was killed by a Herod within the Herod dynasty as well. James was killed by Herod Antipas in Acts chapter 12. The Herodian dynasty were some brutal people, and they were the last of the Edomites. And God says, I see these kind of things, and I will judge these things in my time. Enough is enough is enough. So may we be careful when we look in our own lives and we think about how we relate to other people. May it not be said of us that we refuse to help somebody in need when it's within our capacity to do so. Come to the aid of somebody who is in need. Please don't ever rejoice over their misfortune if someone has done you wrong. Leave, leave all of that up to the Lord, but don't be cheering from the sidelines, and please don't resort to selfish behavior and take advantage of people when they're down. May we be people who honor the Lord and glorify the Lord as his children. Amen? Father, you've overheard, this is your word, and so we pray that you would remind us of these things and that we would be people who would honor you, Lord, take note from your indictment of the Edomites, things that they did wrong over the years, and you were faithful to your promise, Lord. You, you want us to reflect you. You judged a whole people group because they mistreated your people, they dishonored you. And we pray, Lord, that we would look into our own hearts to see if there's any of that behavior in our own lives. If it is, Lord, root it out. Root it out that we would be people who honor you. 
We don't want to take advantage of people. We don't want to refuse to give aid where it's within our capacity. We don't want to rejoice over the misfortune of people who have wronged us, Lord. We, we just leave all that to you. We pray that you would instead use us for your glory. Men and women and young people of your purpose, that you would be honored, Lord. You take note of these things. You see these things, Lord. Rooted out of our own hearts if it's there. This Christmas season especially, may we look at others around us and ask how might we come to their aid? How might we assist them, help them, give to them in a way that would glorify you, Lord? We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you all.